When you hear someone's story, you can begin to look at a problem maybe that's been troubling you, whether it's in your business or your life, but let's talk about business here mainly. Whether it's in your business, you can start to look at the problem in a different way and realize that there may be a different solution to something that's been vexing you, even if it has for a long, long time. So again, we, we learn from the scriptures, and I think I can cite those because we're at BYU, right? Um, we learn from scriptures that w- the power in stories is applying lessons or principles from stories that we hear. So I hope that you'll do that for mine. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures is in the New Testament in the Gospel of John, where the Savior says, I know my sheep and am known of mine. I'm sure you've heard the scripture. I also would bet, I'm not going to take a poll, but I would bet that when you hear that scripture, most of the emphasis is on knowing your sheep, like knowing people, you know, knowing each other. And while that's a good principle, the the part of the scripture that actually speaks to me and is even more important to me is the and am known of mine part. The Savior can be known to us, and there is actually power in being known for who we are and what we are. Um... It's being known at times is harder than knowing because we want to put up walls. We uh, sometimes don't want to share. We're embarrassed about mistakes that we make, whatever the case may be. But being known for who we really are is a powerful principle. And again, I guess I'm kind of prefacing all this with saying I'm going to be vulnerable here for 30 minutes and kind of open wide up, and I hope it's beneficial to you. I want you guys to know me. You'll notice from the title that there's no what, right? The why, who, and how. And there's no what. And that's not by accident. That's actually by design. And here's, here's the reason why. And this is an important principle that I've found in my life, at least. I've actually found that what I'm doing specifically becomes actually less and less important to me than being exceptionally great at whatever it is I'm doing then. The what, the exact specifics of what is less important than how I perform in what I'm doing then. In other words, uh, I guess I feel like there are a lot of paths I could have taken, a lot of things I could have done and been pretty successful in. How many of that, how many of you guys, is that comforting to hear that? Raise your hand. Are you guys wondering what to do? Where to go? Look, you can be excellent at a bunch of things, I bet. At several businesses, potentially. So don't get bogged down in the what of what you're doing. Get bogged down on why you're doing it, or think about why you're doing it, who you're going to do it with, and how you do it. Not necessarily what. Again, as I've, as I've grown up a little bit in my career, I, um, I, I've realized that the what the specifics of the everyday what become a little bit less and less important to me. And it's more about doing the very best. And that's a really a good jumping off point. Or let let me say one other thing, reason why the what, I don't, I've often, when I've talked to, I've, I've mentored quite a few entrepreneurs here. In fact, there's a bunch of good friends that I have here that are in the audience that I've seen and maybe some that I haven't seen. Um, that I've mentored and talked to about businesses, so often we have this fear of just taking a step or going forward. But I've found personally in my life that if I go forward kind of in faith and do the very best that I can, that it's while I'm walking down the path that God or the Holy Ghost can kind of guide me or nudge me. In other words, fear plays a very bad role in kind of innovation and inspiration. It's the opposite of innovation and inspiration, I would say. And so if you're afraid and unsure and you don't make a choice, that's a choice in and of itself, right? Not making a choice. You need to make a choice, walk down a path, and have faith that God will inspire you and that you'll be smart enough to kind of figure it out along the way. And that's a good jumping off point for kind of my uh, story. So you guys ready? Um, so 10 years ago or 12 years ago I was uh, sitting in your spot I was a communication studies major are there any communication studies majors here one, two okay, that's good two out of 
200 or so that are here, communication studies major. I was a communication studies major, but I was an entrepreneur. I played college basketball my freshman year at a, a little school in, outside of Seattle called Western Washington University. I went on a mission and transferred back here to BYU. So I was really into sports. I, I was also a quarterback in high school. And so the re I'm giving you the reason why I did communications is I was really interested in kind of this. I was also interested in kind of broadcasting and or coaching and things like that. And I, I always thought that I'd go and get an MBA. And so I really kind of didn't want to do business on top of business personally. So I was a comm studies major planning on getting an MBA, which, by the way, I have never gotten, and I can tell you more about that as we go. But I was very entrepreneurial and interested in business. Who's heard of the uh, Management Consulting Club? Is that still around? Have you guys heard of it in the Business College, the Management Consulting Club? So even though I was a comm studies major, I got heavily involved with the Management Consulting Club when I was a junior. And then when I was a senior, I ran it with one of my best friends in undergrad, who, by the way, is now one of my partners at Peak. I'll tell more about that story, but we ran it together my senior year. So I was a comm studies major, kind of running the management consulting club. And I had a really cool internship the summer before my senior year. Um, I was driving home from uh, Dallas, Texas, stopped in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was my one year anniversary. I had just gotten married. My wife was already back here in Utah. She taught second grade. And so um, she had to start teaching like the week before. I remember sitting down at the Marriott, I think in Albuquerque, and calling my wife on our anniversary and I was having like steak and lobster because my, uh, the internship I had was like paying for it. My wife was in our apartment at Wideview and, uh, and we kind of talked over the phone. She was gonna teach second grade, so we were rich, right? We were rich. She was making like 2000 a month teaching second grade. I was still going into my senior year. And I remember telling her that I had been thinking or feeling, thinking a lot about a business I might be able to start during my senior year at BYU. Because it's a good decision to be an entrepreneur and to be in control of your destiny, I believe. And so we, we started talking about ideas and talking about names and office space and employees and clients and what we could kind of do to start this business. And it was a really fun and like exciting time. Again, I didn't have to work. I didn't have any children, but I wanted to work, but I wanted to work on my own thing. And so we started a business and like went to work. Uh, shortly thereafter, we got some office space on Center Street right across from uh, New Skin. There used to be an old pharmacy on the main floor. You guys probably don't remember. It's like kitty corner to New Skin this way. That was our first office space. We had like mighty light desks and cheap chairs that like we'd stolen. I don't even know where they came from. Um, and we just went to work and we just started uh, making things happen. At the same time, I was running the management consulting club, remember? with a good friend of mine, his name was Jamie Dunn. And so my senior year, I was finishing school, uh, running my startup, and also flying around the country interviewing with like Bain and McKinsey and groups like that. And obviously there comes that critical time, as you guys know, where you have to kind of make a decision of what you're gonna do, usually, usually about this time, by the way, February or January or February, where you have to decide. And this gets into the why I was an entrepreneur. And again, this is personal. This is my story, but this is why I'm an entrepreneur. And the reason that I'm an entrepreneur, as I thought and prayed and envisioned my future, as I went and interviewed, I remember specifically interviewing with McKinsey and Company in San Francisco and flying home from that interview, I just did not feel comfortable with it. Like, I just did not feel like it fit me right. It just, for me, I guess, and now I know how much more of an entrepreneur I am, too constrictive, or uh, it just didn't fit me. And I had little hints like that kind of all along the way that now are very clear to me in hindsight, but as I was going through them, they maybe weren't as clear. But it just did not feel right. And so as I prayed about it and thought a lot about it, the resounding answer I got is that I should stick with my startup, Mindwire. At that time, we had been running the business for about six months. We had some clients. We had some employees. 
I don't remember exactly, but three or four maybe employees, my partner and I had not taken a penny home. In fact, we had raised a little bit, like $40,000 of kind of seed capital from family and friends, and that was, that was it. We had made a decision that we were going to bootstrap it, which, by the way, I think was a good decision. We had spoken to a bunch of the VC firms and knew them. There were people, I think, pretty anxious to give us money, but we decided we were going to bootstrap it and kind of do it on our own. And... Um, I decide I should do that. And the overwhelming reason for me is uh, of why I'm an entrepreneur is discipleship. And that might seem kind of like a strange concept, but again, this is my story, and this is true. <laughs> the feeling that I had of why I should stick with my business and why I should be an entrepreneur was because of kind of this path of discipleship, right? Can we have something to wipe this off with? Um, we're all kind of on this same path, right? I mean, we're all on this earth, on this same path. It's kind of wide. You can draw a lot of lines through here and zigzags, and people have different paths, but if these are the clear kind of out, outside lines of discipleship, maybe these are the commandments or whatever it may be, we have a bunch of different paths that we can take to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, which is ultimately what matters the most. And the feeling, the overwhelming feeling that I had as I considered my future and as I thought of myself being a consultant or something else or being an entrepreneur, the feeling that I had is that I should be an entrepreneur, that it would be the best way to increase my discipleship. And I think that it has. And you might, maybe you might ask why, but as soon as you are an entrepreneur... I think you'll see why. Because every day you, are, you have important decisions that you are making that are moral decisions. You have payroll decisions, employee decisions, partner decisions, investor decisions, growth kind of in your business decisions, and a myriad of other different issues to kind of decide and contend. Also, you're the leader. You are the entrepreneur. You are the heart and soul of your business. Without you, there would be no business. And so that kind of pressure acts as a great kind of uh, refiner's fire or crucible to help grow your discipleship. It has for me. It's been really challenging to be an entrepreneur, but it's been really, really rewarding, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. That's why I'm an entrepreneur. Um, it's because I felt like it would be the best path for me to become a disciple. So I could tell you a lot more stories about how we kind of grew that business. I remember a funny story. Uh, I remember our first kind of six-figure client, like a job that was, uh, you know, $100,000 plus. I remember it was a big client in Salt Lake, and they wanted to come down to our offices. And we did everything we could to not meet in our offices, right, for obvious reasons. Because if you came into our office, you'd probably be scared. I mean, it just wasn't that nice. We didn't have that much furniture. I remember that we uh, rented furniture for like a day. Spent the night before like moving in all this nice furniture into our office and total like plants, you know, fake plants and all this stuff to make it look like a real and a good office. The, the client came in and was there for several hours, three hours the next day, and then we moved it right out. Um, we didn't get the job, by the way. Um, so that was a bummer. But that was a, that's a kind of a funny startup story. Eventually, we did start getting those six-figure contracts. We grew the business, and we actually grew through the dot-com explosion. Obviously, we know about 9-11. You probably are familiar, at least somewhat, what happened with the stock markets and technology during those years. But technology companies and values just crashed. But we grew through that. Um, and because we grew through that, we gained a lot of notoriety and, uh, and there was a NASDAQ-listed firm out of Southern California. It was kind of a multimedia conglomerate that was gobbling up little agencies like ours. And um, they first kind of came after me and wanted to hire me. And I said, I, I don't want a job and I don't want to be hired, but you could maybe look at our business. And so anyways, eventually uh, we uh, sold the business to a NASDAQ-listed company. And I think I was... Um, that was in 03, 
So is that, so that's nine years ago. So I was like 25 or 26 years old. And by the way, on the other side of the ne negotiating table was like a 50, 50 to 55 year old Harvard MBA. And I was a 25 year old undergrad at BYU. You can probably imagine who got the, the better end of that deal. But it was a great like experience for me to sell my first business to a publicly traded company when I was so young. And it was a, it was a really good learning experience for me. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna jump kind of to the present now. There's a lot of things that I did in between kind of MindWire. There's a lot more I could tell you about MindWire, but I wanna go to the who. And for me, the who is, what I mean by this is with who. I've kind of told you a little bit about myself. I, I'm a team guy. I, play, I played team sports my entire growing up. Uh, I love football and basketball. I, I still, still play them and still love them. I just love team sports. And I personally feel like that the joy you can have with partners is better on your own. One of the things that I notice when entrepreneurs come to talk to me is they often ask me like, should I have partners or should I get a partner or I don't want partners, like I wanna do everything on my own. And for me, again, personally in my story, my partners have been critical to all the business things that I've done. I couldn't have done anything that I've done without good partners. Again, as I try, I often think about, you may think about this too sometimes, I often think about like, what's, what's most important in life? What could I spend my time on that means the most? And usually what I come back to is, I, I don't really know for sure, you probably don't know, but what I'm confident is is that some of the things that are most important are probably some of the things that last the longest. And we know that relationships can last forever. And I just feel like having partners that you can share the successes and joys of business with are really important. So for me, the who is with good partners. And let me tell you two kind of key principles. You might wanna take a couple notes about how to choose like good, good partners. Because again, when I speak to entrepreneurs, they often ask me, how do you choose a good partner, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna tell you the exact specifics because it's not an exact science, I don't think. However, here are two key principles that I think you can follow. So the who, um, number one and most importantly, and I'll tell you more about my current partners here in a minute in my current uh, company because they're two of my best friends and two great guys, but you've got to have the same core principles and values. Number one, although you could be totally different and it doesn't matter, a bunch of things don't matter if you're different, but your core kind of principles and values, your core foundational goals, you have got to be as close to alignment in those with your partners as you possibly can. If you are potentially partners with someone or thinking about being partners with someone where you don't feel this is the case, in my experience, again, this kind of goes back to discipleship, when the, when the waves hit your startup boat, it is really hard or it can be really easy to give up principles or to cheat this or that. And if you do not have good partners that, that have your back and that are with you in the core foundational principles that matter, I, I just think in the long run, you're setting yourself up for some heartache and potential problems. Number two, the number two principle, again, this is something I think you can apply consistently. Strengths that complement your weaknesses. This, again, goes back to part of the discipleship. Um, you need to be self-aware. <laughs> you need to know some of the things you're good at and some of the things that you're not so good at. And you need to surround yourself, I think, with people in a business that complement your weaknesses. You need to be aware of what your strengths are, what you can excel at, and what you can't, and make sure that your partners round out your team and kind of help you in, in that way. Who hook up my iPad? Um, let me tell you about my latest venture. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be kind of personal about how this one came about. It's kind of an interesting story. Uh, so I had sold uh, my first company, my technology business. And honestly, I was, I was messing around with some other things. There were a couple other businesses that I had. One was called Hydropods. One was called Everything But The Chef. 
Um, but nothing was clicking and just taking off. And I was looking seriously at going back to graduate school. In fact, I was kind of on my way. Uh, and I was actually probably, my wife and I had been out to Boston twice. And I was going to Harvard to get a theological studies degree. I don't. Does anyone have a USB that we could connect my iPad with? I don't know. Um, David can help you out here, maybe. Um, so I was actually going to get to get a theological studies, a master's degree in divinity, and um, I was uh, 27 years old, and I uh, was kind of on my way, and I was actually called to be a bishop in my home ward uh, in Provo, and that totally changed my course. As I was leaving, and uh, I now was kind of stuck in Provo. And that wasn't necessarily bad. I'm glad that it happened, but it was a surprise, obviously, to me. And I was really young, but it totally altered my course. After we, I sold Mindwire, I had taken the proceeds of that exit and rolled it into real estate, which is something that my dad did growing up and something that I knew quite a bit about and really liked. And I won huge kind of in real estate when everyone was winning huge. You guys might be a little young, but, you know, I mean, the real estate market was crazy, as you guys know, five or six years ago. And I turned that money over several times, but I had some foresight to understand that there is no way that this market could stay this hot. There's no way that it could last. And so I started having uh, a bunch of discussions with uh, guys about starting kind of a real estate real estate fund or private equity firm. And the one, one that I spoke to the most was uh, the guy I ran the management consulting club with at BYU. His name's Jamie Dunn. He had gone on uh, to Bain in Dallas, actually, and then got an MBA at Wharton and was working for a large multifamily developer in the southeastern United States. And I started sharing some of my thoughts with him. I wanted to buy, number one, distressed real estate, and number two, apartment communities for like cash flow. Because I was interested in cash flow on my, on my capital. Plus, I was afraid of kind of what was coming. Owning real assets obviously can be a great hedge in a declining market. Um, and, and I wanted to own real assets with cash flow. And so he immediately hooked me up with who's become our third partner now and another great friend of mine. His name is Jeff Danley. Um, he, had got, he worked in private equity and, and venture on the East Coast in Connecticut and was working for, got an MBA at Dartmouth. That's where he and Jamie met. They met at some kind of Ivy League uh, schmooze fest in Manhattan, LDS schmooze in Manhattan. And he was working for a large apartment uh, developer in Southern California. Jeff flew up and we met at Thanksgiving Point kind of over a deal. This is like five years ago. And we were talking about a specific deal, and about 10 minutes into it, I said, what I really want to do is take my capital, raise additional capital, and create like a fund and do more sophisticated deals, the kind of deals that you and Jamie have been doing at your current companies that, by the way, I hadn't really done before. And uh, shortly thereafter, we formed P Capital Partners, and uh, Jeff immediately moved here. Jamie wound down some things he was doing in North Carolina and moved here after. Those are my two partners now. We have the same core values, and Jeff and Jamie's, I think, strengths really complement my weaknesses, and we make a great team. I, I wanted to show you guys some things. I don't know if we'll be able to. Um, who's seen the big project south of campus? That's our project, okay? Okay. Um, you may have seen on the sign, there's a real small P Capital Partners name. It's not that big, so you might not have noticed it, but that, that's our firm. Um, we started the firm with kind of the thesis that there had to be a pullback in real estate. And here's where I'll get into a little bit more of the details with what I'm currently doing, and hopefully it will spark some questions for the Q&A after. But we had this thesis that there was going to be a pullback in real estate, and we wanted to buy distress in distress opportunities and also in cash flow. And this was like in 06 or 07. We did our first deal at the very beginning of 07. It was a distressed deal. It turned out great. 
We invested a little bit of capital and we had an investor invest a million dollars. The return was fantastic and the next time that he invested, he invested $10 million. And that's kind of how we've grown. Uh, a couple of interesting things is that we, could, we did a couple of distressed deals during uh, 07, 08, and 09, but if we had deployed our capital into apartment communities at that time, that was the wrong time to be in apartment communities. Like it kind of hadn't tipped yet, right? So we spent the first couple of years basically establishing these relationships with sellers, large sellers of multifamily assets, large apartment assets, and were ready to buy when it tipped and pricing got better for buyers. We're buying mainly from large distressed institutions. I won't say any of their names uh, in the lecture, I guess, but you would have heard of them. These are large banks that own a lot of multifamily assets. And as they look at the, around their portfolio and they say, how are we gonna pay the federal government back? Or how are we gonna fix our balance sheet they have to look across their portfolio of assets and decide what they can maybe sell. <clears throat> and the only thing they can sell are these apartment assets. So we're happy to raise our hand and say, we'll buy them at this price. And at first, uh, people would uh, swear at us and not be happy with us. Then they'd say no. Then they'd say maybe. And then they'd say, well, what about this price? And we'd say no. And finally, they'd say, fine. We'll just we'll sell it to you. So in the last... Uh, three years, we've bought about um, $250 million worth of apartment assets. Cash flowing, these are B-class, urban infill, strong location kind of cash flowing apartment assets. So myself and my two partners invest in each of these deals and we've raised roughly 75 or 80 million in outside equity or capital that we've also invested into these companies. So we have our own capital and then we have investor capital and we buy these large multifamily assets. We're looking for like kind of a quarterly cash flow dividend and then some appreciation to increase the total IRR or return on investment kind of at an exit. We own a little over 20 assets, like I said, about a $250 million uh, portfolio balance and we've deployed about 80 million in equity, okay? So maybe there's some questions. Any luck? Okay. Do you have any ideas, Gary? Of how we can? Anybody want to? Okay. No big deal. What I wanted to show you guys was a couple of. I wanted to take you to a website, and I want to show you a couple of pictures of our projects. So we've talked about our projects. We own in several kind of strategic markets. Salt Lake, we own about eight assets in Salt Lake. We own in Denver and Colorado Springs because we know this kind of Intermountain West market. And then we also uh, own in the southeastern United States. That's where my partner Jamie is from. We know those markets well. Plus, there are two key drivers and really the two most important drivers of apartment assets are one, um, population growth, which Utah just has organically, right? There seems to be an unending amount of young families that we can just create in Utah. And the southeastern markets have right from in-migration from the northeast. There's a lot of in-migration from the northeast into the southeast. And then also just job creation is the second, the, the economy or jobs. That is the second driver of multifamily. Obviously, the Intermountain West, Denver, and Salt Lake has fared a little bit better than a lot of markets. And there are pockets of the southeast that we like to concentrate on, like the Raleigh-Durham area, et cetera, that have fared better as well. So we've bought a lot of assets there. Um, like, like I said, we own a little over 20 assets, and uh, we're having a good time buying as much as we possibly can. Let me tell you in the last seven minutes, a couple of other, I wanted to show you the, um, our website for the village at South Campus. Can you, can you just pull up the, it's the village at South Campus. <coughs> So this is a cool project, guys. I just want to tell you a quick about it. This was a distressed opportunity. We kind of bought this land out of bankruptcy, not even sure if we were necessarily going to develop it. We had one investor, great guy from California that wanted to develop it, and we have. Um, upon completion, the village at South Campus will be the most valuable apartment asset in the entire state of Utah. 
Uh, we have chose to invest an additional $5 million over kind of our original plans to provide students with a different BYU housing experience uh, and also to ensure kind of the longevity of the project. We plan on owning this project for multiple generations, for basically forever, for the, kind of for the foreseeable future. There are 236 units, 944 students will be there this time next year. And as you've seen, maybe it kind of covers like two city blocks. So, so this is a specific asset that will affect, and we hope positively affect, BYU and our al alma mater. All three of the partners went to undergrad at BYU. So the village at South Campus, you've probably heard of it, right, and seen it. Um, if we scroll down, let's see. We can take a, a look at kind of the current, so that's, that's kind of a current camera picture of kind of what's going on there, okay? So anyways, I'm, I'm not trying to like uh, market it, honestly. You can turn that off now if you want, but I wanted to show you, that's, a, that's an example of a project that you guys are probably familiar with, right? And that's an example of kind of the projects that we're building and developing. Last thing, last thing that I'll say on this, and then I'll move into just a couple quick kind of how-tos, in my opinion, that are important. We also invest in operating businesses. I'm an entrepreneur. I can't help myself. Like, I love business. And uh, one of the businesses that we invested in a couple of years ago and that I kind of ran for a year or so was the BYU Business Plan Competition winner, I think in 08 or 09. It was called Meter Solutions. Have you guys heard of Meter Solutions? It was kind of a meter installation company slash energy analytics company that we invest. They had a really messy, messy capital structure. We invested in, cleaned the capital structure up, kind of grew the business, scaled it, and then sold it to Vivint um, just a couple of years ago, a really good exit. We've also done two other operating business deals and are looking at three or four more right now. So we'll continue to buy real estate, and we want to buy as, as much real estate as we possibly can while the buying's good. We just feel like the best risk-adjusted returns are to be found in multifamily real estate in this market. But we will continue to kind of ramp up our true kind of private equity or venture capital side also, and we'll invest in more kind of operating businesses, including small startups out of BYU. We like that niche. I like small startups. Um, it's what I've done. And we also love BYU and want to kind of give back to BYU. So there's a little bit of story about MindWire, about Peak Capital, about why I'm an entrepreneur, who, let me just end, we end at 250, right? Um, let me just end with a couple of hows really quick that I feel like are really important. We have one minute for each. Again, this might be something you want to take notes about or not. It's up to you. Number one, no matter what you do, do it with integrity. Do it the right way. If there's anything that BYU students should stand for, business students and otherwise, it should be being honest and true. And again, let me just tell you, as you get more and more experience in the real world and in the business world, you will understand some of the, of the challenges and nuance around this. Whatever you do, do it with integrity and do it, do it the right way. It's the most important thing to do. A second thing I would say, and I hope that someone's kind of pulled this out of my story, but I consider myself at least a contrarian, and I would encourage you to be a contrarian. What I mean by that is you, could prob you probably recognized when technology was bad, I liked technology and I grew a technology business and sold it to a publicly traded company. When real estate was out of favor and everyone was really scared about real estate, I wanted to buy as much real estate as I possibly could. In other words, don't follow the herd. Sometimes that can be okay. Sometimes building a new app is cool and the right but don't be afraid of doing your own thing and being a little contrarian to what kind of where the herd or the crowd is going. I think that's an important principle to look after. It's been important in my career and in my life. And then lastly, uh, be persistent. 
I just can't emphasize this enough, guys. Um, I remember sitting in your seats 10 or 12 years ago. I wondered, how could I be successful? What am I going to do? And I'm just here to tell you, after only 10 or 12 years of experience, that I'm just confident that if you are persistent and stick with it and realize there are going to be ups and downs, that you'll be successful and that you can be successful. Sometimes some of the darkest times can lead to some of the greatest discoveries and opportunities that you will have in your life. So if you feel like you have a heart for entrepreneurship, like you want to be an entrepreneur, don't give up. Be wise in your decisions and how you integrate it in your life, but be persistent and uh, follow your dreams. I have every confidence in you guys that you guys can do it. Hopefully this was a little bit helpful. Thanks for uh, having me come. <laughs>